I would like to thank Christine and the Society of Apothecaries for the opportunity to, for me to give this paper. It has been such an interesting journey preparing for it. My first degree is in social and economic history, and I feel happiest focusing on primary source material from the 18th and 19th centuries. Sadly, because of lockdown, there was no opportunity to do that in preparation for the paper. There are many examples from the late 19th and 20th century of patients being seen as an object, a cost and a case. And I've referred to some of these. I've used some 19th century primary source material, including manuscripts from a project that I insisted in collecting the data from the Scottish collection of letters and diaries of women in British political families from 1870 to 1914. The development of the patient and the self-help movement is a mid 20th century phenomenon, as is also the beginning of the patient being seen as a person rather than just a case. It is appreciated that many patients may have been treated very kindly in individual dealings with their doctor, but this is scarcely referred to in major text. Patients as partners with professional colleagues is just beginning. So we now look at patients as a case. The sociologist Talcott Parsons, 1902 to 1979, drew attention to what he described as the sick role, where patients have roles assigned to them. Roy Porter, 1946 to 2002, the historian, suggested that these rules, roles depend on, and I quote, who is doing the analysis or the accountancy with patients appearing as demand, costs and benefits, input or output, voters, clients or consumers of services, bearers of rights or pursuers of litigation, the hip in bed 15, frozen sperm in the deep freeze, disease bodies or clinical material, points of a graph and numbers crunched on a software program. Roy Porter, the greatest benefit to mankind, and that's taken from page 668. The patient is a case, a body, trussed up in the bed, especially tidy for the important ward round, characterized in several films, including Doctor in the House and Doctor at Large, particularly when the surgeon, the consultant, was played by the Scottish actor, James Robertson Justice, 1907 to 1975. He was perhaps best known for his role as the peppery surgeon, Sir Lancelot Spratt. With his commanding presence, he was a large man and had a booming voice. It is very easy to think that his portrayal of the ward round is exaggerated. I recommend you look at a little clip from the film in Doctor of the House if you're not already familiar with the film. However, descriptions by nurses in the 1960s support the emphasis on the pressure, but in particularly on student nurses, to ensure that the ward was impeccable and the bed very tidy with the patients discouraged from moving. There is also a booklet that I've been unable to locate advising ward sisters on how to conduct a ward round. It is perhaps worth remembering that the sister was the host, the consultant and his colleagues were guests. Hospital rounds seldom previously acknowledged the patient's existence, perhaps asking a question for clarification. The purpose was to solve the diagnostic puzzle. Thus, there was seldom a greeting, perhaps not even a smile of reassurance to a person in the bed. There was no small talk explanation of the purpose of questions to colleagues, nor any elicitation of worries that may be held by the patient. It was like an exam, but it was to detect a sign. The patient was an object, the subject barely noticed. In the late 1960s, a photo appeared in an Edinburgh newspaper. It was taken on a bitterly cold wintry afternoon 
in early February of a queue of patients winding down steps and along pavements. It was snowing gently and the ground was very slippery. These were patients waiting to attend the fracture clinic of Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, which was held at the time in the old building in Teviot Place. Some were on crutches, some in wheelchairs, some supported by friends or family. All ages were represented. It was estimated that there were some 80 patients waiting. Subsequently to this photograph, there was considerable discussion in the local press about the problems created by booking many patients for the same clinic at the same time, known as block booking. Whose interests were being served, we should ask. An argument for this approach and put forward by the Health Board in Edinburgh was that it ensured the best possible use of the time of doctors and other health professionals. The patient is again a cost, but their time is not considered. Many antenatal clinics in the 1960s and 1970s were organized in a similar way with the patients booked for the same time. This resulted in a long wait for many women who often had to collect other children from school. There was no guarantee of the availability of creche facilities at the clinic. Some women simply missed their appointment because they could not afford the time for a long wait. After many years, the practice of block booking has now ceased. I quote a recent reference, patients should be not only overbooked onto a clinic when there is a clinical need to see that patient in a clinic that is already full. Consideration must be given to the number of patients booked onto the same appointment time slot. And that comes from the University Hospital Le Leicester Outpatient Clinic Template Management Policy in December 2020. A further later but similar example was the decision to utilize wards for the maximum efficiency of the hospital. This was the practice of mixed sex wards, <coughs> replacing single wards, a practice that seems to have crept in in the 1980s. Providers of hospital services at the time commented that single sex wards, and I quote, reduce asset, asset utilization, and that equal numbers of male and female patients do not come into hospital at the same time. <coughs> Excuse me. It was also stated that loss of flexibility of mixed sex wards could result in the reduction in bed availability for emergency admissions. This is, a, is, is from a little paper, Mix X Wards in 1995, of which I was a senior author and Eileen Terrell was the other one. There is an excellent, this is an excellent example of patients being seen as an asset or a liability as described by Porter. The last example I'm using is where patients are seen not as a whole person, but a bit, a specimen. Most patients have at some time been asked to provide a sample, including urine, blood or sputum for a test, though the purpose of the test has not always been explained to the patient. Some patients may be aware where the lab is, uh, often in the hospital basement. Traditionally, laboratory staff have had limited or no dealings directly with the majority of patients although this may, may now be changing as there is a movement for patients to be able to access some test results directly from the lab. Lab staff do not always appreciate or they disregard the discomfort or even pain experienced by patients having to give the specimens, particularly true for patients who are difficult to cannulate and having to give a blood sample. This can partly explain the apparent carelessness when a specimen is discarded because it arrives slightly too late or not at the exact amount. An even more serious problem 
first emerged with the publication of the Royal Liverpool Children's Hospital Older A Inquiry report involving unauthorised removal, retention and disposal of human tissue, including children's organs, between 1988 and 1995. Organs were retained from around 850 infants by Professor Van Yeltsen, including the hearts, brains and eye collections. Similar problems happened at Bristol Royal Infirmary and York Hill Children's Hospital, Glasgow. Parents talked about their distress at having a buried a shell, an incomplete body. They insisted that their permission had not been sought to remove the organs, nor had anybody explained why it was necessary. Many parents said that if they had been asked and the reasons explained to them, they would have agreed. I think it is worth mentioning here the anguish described by parents on the death of a child. Women in the 19th century wrote eloquently about the death of a child, then a not uncommon occurrence. In the Gladstone Diaries, volume four, 1848 to 1854, there are references to the death of little Jessie, the 9th of April, 1850, and then on the 11th of April, 1850, and I quote, came the closing of the coffin and the last kiss upon the cold eve features of our little Jessie. It was a pang for me, a deep one for a mother who is going to part from her sooner." Close quotes. And almost a century later, the same sentiment is expressed at Sir Liam Donaldson's Chief Medical Officer Summit Transcript, 2001, number six, and I quote, when a child dies, that child is still the parent's child, not a specimen, not a case, not an unfortunate casualty of a failed procedure, but somebody's baby, somebody's child, in close quotes. I do not believe that those pathologists were wicked people. They simply were far removed from patients and had not thought through carefully the implications of what they were doing. Now turn to look as the patient as a person. So William Osler, 1849 to 1919, stated, and I quote, the good physician treats the disease, but the great physician treats the patient, close quotes. This sentiment is also reflected in the work of the med Canadian medical humanist, Michael Ballant, 1896 to 1970. And it is interesting to note that the Royal College of General Practitioners put a blue plaque up in 2018 to commemorate the work of the Ballant Society. The scenario described above seem to demonstrate an almost complete lack of appreciation that the patient is a person, a mother, father, son or daughter, who has feelings and concerns, but they may be unable to express. It is perhaps not surprising by the late 1950s and early 1960s, new social movements were emerging, focusing on the need of the individual. Uh, organizations were emerging, often identifying problems that were not always recognized at the time. Many organizations started from a group of people coming together out of self-interest and developed into a wider campaigning network. For example, the Child Poverty Action Group, the National Association for the Welfare of Children in Hospital, Help the Aged, by the mid 20th century, there was evidence of a very gradual shift in attitudes in society to professions and other services. The consumer movement had started and very many health, voluntary health organizations were beginning to focus on the patient as a person. As voluntary organizations developed a well-informed and effective user lobby, it has been mainly for maternity services. Maternity services are different from most other health services as the user, the woman, 
is generally healthy. Prior to the foundation of the NHS in 1948, most women gave birth at home with the assistance of a midwife. After the 1948, obstetricians became involved and gradually most births took place in hospital. The medicalization of childbirth had begun involving interventions, tests and technology. It's not surprising therefore that this combined with the dissatisfaction about attitudes to patients prevalent in antenatal clinics and in labor wards experienced by many and described below resulted in the formation of a user-led organization, the National Childbirth Association, later the National Childbirth Trust, NCT, in 1956. The NCT was promoting the ideas of Dr. Grant Dick Reed, 1890 to 1915, and was committed to either home births or birth in a homely, non-threatening maternity unit where the women were encouraged to express their views and be part of the team involved in their care. Women were commenting that the treatment in one of Edinburgh's maternity hospitals, the Simpson, was not always dignified. Women were left in the lithotomy position, waiting for the doctor and in a cub cubicle open to staff at one end. There were other grumbles in the health council equivalent to the Community Health Council in England. This resulted in the publication Having a Baby in Edinburgh in March 1981, where information about the four maternity units in Edinburgh at the time were compared with the cooperation of staff. Sadly, there was no information from the women themselves about their experiences. That was for a later study. It should be remembered that exclusion from women from the medical profession, except in secondary roles, was mainly effective in England and Wales until the 1880s and 1890s. The number of female doctors increased from 25 in 1881 to 101 in 1891 and 477 by 1911, according to the census returns. Gynecology was dominated by women. Women, men. Women, therefore, had little choice of the gender of the practitioner. Attitudes to women's health were influenced by male doctors, instruction for childbirth, and here I quote from the 19th century, let the laboring woman place her full confidence in the advice of her medical attendant, who should be appropriately educated. She should follow his direction, have no opinion of her own, and pay no attention whatsoever to any contrary advice that may be proposed by her nurse or others." Close quote. And that was from Dr. Michael Ryan, A Manual of Midwifery, 4th edition, 1841. In the mid 20th century, a quite different approach to childbirth was being described by the Austrian Erna, Erna Wright, 1923 to 2004, who introduced the Lamaze method of training for childbirth, where women would know precisely what to do at each stage of labor. labor. This was based on an understanding uh, and mastery of the four different levels of breathing there was considerable concern amongst doctors and midwives. The training helped women to understand what was happening to them and how to deal with it. Sheila Kitzinger, 1929 to 2015, was another childbirth activist who campaigned for choice for women and how they gave birth and where they gave birth. She too developed the ideas of Grantly Decreed and spent much time training with women midwives and obstetricians. Her approach was much the same as Erna Wright, but Kitzener had a very engaging personality. Sadly, though things have improved, not all the recommendations of these advocates have yet been accepted. Pat Yelland, an Australian social historian, explores attitudes of women in British political families from 1860 to 1914 in her study entitled Women, Marriage and Politics. Jalland 
searched the collections of about 50 British political families, including the Gul Gladstone Papers, Haldane, Minto, Belfer and Alfer, and Athol. The letters and diaries of these women were examined and according to Pat Yelland, deserve some attention. Most of these women could afford the best doctors available who were often the authors of influential medical texts of the time. There is no evidence that these women read the popular health and childbirth manuals. Overall, the women's negative comments about their doctors outweighed their positive ones. They exchanged information about doctors with others and frequently substituted a second doctor with a different remedy if the treatment of the first seemed ineffective or inappropriate. They were very clear that they were employing the doctor. There was little deferential behaviour and they had no qualms about seeking a second opinion. For example, in one of her letters, Elizabeth Haldane, Lady Ackroyd, and I quote, states, I care little for medical opinion, as a, doctors can only say as to the future that is in God's hands, close quote. And then goes on. Lady Cowper was well informed about various medical specialties, and I quote, Cumberbatch is very clever and very attentive about chest. Reed, I think, very clever and easy. Burrows tip top, but more for kidney disease, like Bright. Close quotes. These women criticized doctors for their apparent desire to line their pockets and overcharge for medication that these women said was of limited or no use. Interestingly, the British Medical Association, BMA, published two books, Secret Remedies and What They Contain, and More Secret Remedies, in response to the thousands of advertisements for the public in 1909 and 1912, which were mostly worthless and harmful. These adverts appeared in magazines, new newspapers, billboards, buses, trams, and railway stations. The remedies covered all possible complaints and mostly contained everyday chemicals, including table salt, bicarbonate of soda, tartaric acid, borax, and sugar, with a little colouring too. Some doctors believed that the reputation of the medical profession was at stake if they were associated with these remedies. This is described very recently by a medical journalist called Caroline Richmond. And a further example of the disenchantment of some patients to doctors and money, here is a long quote from Lady Evelyn Murray to her brother, the Marquis of Tullibardeen. And I quote, please tell me something about cousin Emily. And I, this is Miss Emily Murray McGregor, now that you've seen her yourself. Her doctor will probably know more about her than she will herself, as they normally have a way of fibbing to their patients. Poor cousin Emily, it would be better for her that she should go altogether than she should remain almost helpless and her life would not be worth anything. When a person is very ill, it is impossible for them to eat anything. A doctor can't do it himself when he is ill. Doctors spend their time preaching what they don't practice. It wouldn't, I wouldn't say they would have died if they hadn't done, if they weren't told. When doctors die, when people die after an operation, have you never noticed that, according to the doctor, the operation has always been successful, but the patient dies of something else? Doctors only think of their pockets. And I quote Lady Evelyn Murray to her brother on the 12th of April, 1991, from the Athol Papers, and that's Blair Castle. So now we turn to the beginning of partnership. In 1920, 1972, three GPs, Dr. Tim Payne from Bristol, Dr. Peter Pritchard from Barnsfield, South Oxfordshire, and Dr. Tudor, Julian Tudor Hart uh, from South Wales, independently and unknown to each other, established patient participation groups, PPGs, in their practice. I have a nice photograph of the three of them, particularly of Peter Pritchard and Tim Payne, 
receiving an award from the then president of the RCG, Terry Kemple, in recognition of their work. Julian Tudor Hart is perhaps best known for his inverse care law, commented that the establishment of an elected patients committee in a general practice is a new form of democracy in the NHS. The Aberdare committee is elected, not appointed, is accountable downwards to those elected it, that is, the patients, unlike their health authorities that are appointed and account accountable upwards to those who appoint them. The functions of the Aberdare group are described as follows. To participate with doctors in the running of the primary care service services at the health centre, to consider improvements in and complaints about the services, to provide health education and other lectures, to communicate the opinions and views of patients to other statutory bodies and to improve the levels of care available. These functions were common to the other PPGs established by Peter Pritchard and Tim Payne. In 1978, the National Association for Patient Participation, NAPP, was established by Tim Payne. This was the same year as the WHO Alma Atta Declaration was adopted at an international conference on primary care. And I quote, people have a duty and a right to participate individually and collectively in the in planning and implementation of their care, close quote. The aims of NAP include to help improve the quality of services in general practice, to support and encourage the development of PPGs in every practice, promoting the role of PPGs as partners in decision-making in the practice, and remembering that each group should be based on mutual trust between patients in the practice and the primary care team to work with professional bodies, regulators and policy makers at regional and national level. Some of the functions and aims of NAP have been achieved, but governments change the goalposts, making it quite challenging at times to make progress. It should be noticed that the driving force behind the establishment of NAP were not patients, but GPs. It was not until some 30 years after the Alma Atta Declaration and the formation of NAP that the NHS Constitution of 2009 stated, and I quote, that you have a right to be involved directly or through representation in the planning of health services the development and consideration of proposals for changes in the way the services are provided and decisions to be made affecting the operation of these services, close quote. Sadly, many patients and in organisations, including NAP, still complain that they are not fully consulted about proposed changes, or if they are, it's too late. Partnership involves shared decision making, and the hopes and the founders of NAP was it would do just that in the consultation, but also in discussion about planning healthcare at regional level. In the 20th century, many express their frustration that patients are reporting that decisions are made without consultation. In 2007, Richardson and Coulter reported that patients said that they were not as much involved in decision making as they wished, but wished, wished they wished with 32% in primary care and 48% in hospitals. This was drawn from a national study. The GPPS, the General Practitioners Patient Survey, provides some information, but it is extremely long and therefore not so reliable as it may as many patients get tired before completing the survey. The feminist and literary scholar, Caroline Heilbrun, wrote in 1899, sorry, I beg your pardon, 1989, and I quote, power 
is to take one's place, the ability to take one's place in whatever discourse is essential to action and the right to have one's part in the matter, close quote. One of the difficulties for the patient lobby is that patients do not form a homogeneous group. No single organization speaks for all patients who may hold many and disparate views and have many different needs, different illnesses, different social problems. The government supported community health councils in England used to perform that task. Some were excellent, capturing the wishes of the local community. They were, there has been no equivalent replacement. Perhaps Health Watch is the nearest, uh, but they are also able to investigate complaints on behalf of patients. Some providers feel that they're, they question, are suspicious of them and question their independence. The work of patient of a pa being a patient is seldom discussed by professionals and managers. For them, the patient's time is free. Most patients accept the situation, but do doctors really understand this position of patients? If patients are to be involved in shared decision-making with their doctors, it is important that they do. Patients with chronic illness uh, conditions have to learn how to self-care during the majority of the time that they are not attending clinics and hospitals and GPs and juggle with getting on with their everyday life. Yet, according to Victor Montori in Why We Revolt, published in 2017, he cannot recollect, recollect mention of the patient's work of a the, and their time in a single medical textbook, nor mentioned in medical lectures. He also Sorry, I, I've lost my place <laughs> in the paper. Um, he also criticized uh, healthcare managers who have proclaimed, and I quote, the patient is the most underused resource in healthcare, close quote. Patient work is invisible, but also free. Healthcare tends to delegate more and more work to patients and removes these costs from the balance sheets. Once more in the 21st century, the patient is still a cost. The history of the doctor-patient relationship from ancient times to the present day bears testimony to the caring dedication of doctors to their patients' physical welfare. The same history by its silence bears testimony to their patients' rights and needs to make their own decisions. Little appreciation of disclosure and even consent, except negatively, and emphasis on patients' incapacities to apprehend the mysteries of medicine and hence share the burdens of decision-making with their, their doctors is discussed in the literature. See, for example, J. Katz, The Silent Work of Doctors and Patients in 1984. Many patients' organizations understand that it is not easy to access power, uh, to be a partner at the table, or to be a part of the key conservation conversations, as described by Heilbrun. Sometimes the conversations are not happening, but it is important to know when they are. It, progress is extremely slow. Uh, and there is a long way to come, go, but patients can become real partners in all aspects of their health care. Thank you for listening.